Welcome to the Anthropology and Business Podcast, where you'll learn about the many ways anthropology is applied in business and why business anthropology is one of the most effective lenses for making sense of organizations and consumers. Through conversations with leading anthropologists working in advertising, marketing, consumer behavior, organizational culture, user experience, and many other roles, you'll learn firsthand what it means to do business anthropology and how the work differs from academic anthropology. We'll discuss issues like the pace and depth of research in business, our visibility and influence as practitioners, and what we can do to build our brand. We will also focus on the value and impact of our research in business so that we can help business leaders understand why they should be hiring anthropologists. I'm your host, Matt Arts, a business anthropologist specializing in design anthropology and working at the intersection of product management, user experience, and business strategy. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Anthropology and Business Podcast. Today, I'm here with Ken Banks. Ken is currently the head of social purpose at Yoti and is working on a book, The Pursuit of Purpose, which we'll talk about. Uh, Previously, uh, had founded Kiwanja, which developed Frontline SMS, which was a messaging platform that scaled to 190 countries before Ken had stepped back in 2012 from that work. So we're going to be digging into a little bit of that past work and how anthropology informed that platform to scale to the degree that it did. We're going to talk a little bit about social purpose, talk about the book. So Ken, thanks for joining me. Would you start by telling everybody a little bit about your, your anthropological background and how you came into that? Sure. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to talk to you. Uh, So I fell into anthropology completely by accident. Um, I was primarily interested in global development and humanitarian work. I'd seen Live Aid in 85. It had piqued my interest. And I decided I wanted to turn my tech skills and my other sort of life skills to contributing towards solutions rather than just being part of the problem. And when I decided I needed to study global development a little bit more closely to get a really good handle on you know how it worked, how it didn't work, uh, I approached Sussex University and you couldn't just do development studies, you had to do it with something. It was development studies with Spanish, development studies with French, development studies with library studies and development studies with anthropology. And so I thought, Anthropology sounds interesting, or social anthropology, that sounds interesting. Um, And so I I took it for that reason. So it's really Sussex University's fault that I actually ever really took an interest in that subject. And I'm amazingly grateful that they did. Yeah, it's. uh, I hear many times about people who actually weren't even really quite aware of anthropology for one reason or another and, you know, sort of naturally found their way there. Um, It was always bones and, you know, that that sort of... um, you know, sort of figure that I always thought anthropology was always about. It was, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and yeah, exactly. all that. And, 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 you know, we kind of know that's not necessarily the case, but anthropology for me always was 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 bones and things. I think social anthropology was new to me as a discipline mm-hmm. at the time. I've done sociology, which which was sort of close, of course. It's, a, it's sort of a sister, I suppose, subject. But, I mean, I, I loved it when I discovered it, but I just never knew it was there. So... Yeah. On LinkedIn, you refer to yourself not only as an anthropologist, but a technologist. And so what do you mean by technologist and why do you use that term? So I I learned to code when I was in my very early teens, in the early 80s, um, purely by accident. Again, much of my career has been accidental, random, serendipitous, which is why the book's coming out, really. And and we'll talk more about that a bit bit later. So I'd learned to code when I was very young, um, before they, in fact, taught IT in schools. And it just became a theme of my career. Um, I was just happened to be very good at it. Um, I picked it up very quickly. I was able to write pretty much anything that I wanted. When I took a a strong interest in global development, originally at the very beginning, you know, in the 80s, you couldn't do much with technology. The internet wasn't around. Mobile phones weren't around. You know, most of development was about building dams and large infrastructure projects. But um, I, I waited and I hung on. And slowly the world caught up with me. And the internet appeared, mobile technology appeared. And so I just started applying the things that I was best at to global development. And that was technology and in particular, mobile phones. So the reason I have technologists in there isn't because I'm necessarily a, you know, somebody who tries to continually push technology towards things where technology might not be the answer, because we see a lot of that 
Um, it's there because technology has been a theme of my work really from the beginning and a, and a theme of my life, I suppose. Um, and I think it's also a nice contrast with the anthropology because the technology is the tool and the anthropology focuses on the people that use the tool. So it feels like it kind of comes at it from both ends. Yeah, it's funny you say that, um, you know, because it, it obviously relates to identity, right? How we sort of represent ourselves. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about digital identity. But I bring that up because in the past I used to use technologists in my heading as well, because I come from uh, an IT background. That's, you know, I grew up, right? You know, 1985, first personal computer in the house and was always sort of involved and, uh, it was always clear that that's what I was going to school to study, you know, so studied information systems and then, at, you know, graduate level management information systems. Um, and I, so I used technologists for years and I actually dropped it at one point because of what you just said, which is it sort of oftentimes assume that that then becomes like how, you know, it's the hammer with which you sort of saw, you know, hit every kind of nail with, right. And, and solve every, every, uh, every problem with, um, and I dropped it somewhere along the way because of appreciating that technology is not always the solution, right? And uh, it can be a good solution to many problems, but it's not the only one. And so it's interesting to hear your perspective on that and how you combine them. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Um, so to pick back up on the development theme. So obviously <clears throat> you're, you're, you're approaching development from a perspective of the technology space, particularly mobile phones. So tell us a little bit about, you know, the, how you get to the point of even wanting to develop frontline SMS, you know, what did you see in developing markets that that uh, was something that was needed and, you know, how did anthropology, well, and then we'll get to maybe how anthropology contributed to that. Yeah, sure. So um, again, I, I, I fell into mobile technology and global development again, completely by accident. It was actually an accident. I broke my leg in Nigeria towards the end of 2002 Ended up back home in Jersey recovering, and I got a phone call from somebody who had just got a million dollars from the Vodafone Group Foundation to look at mobile technology and development. And this was December 2002. And I think it was the first time I'd seen anybody looking at that. Um, you know, now it's everywhere. And so they said, we need somebody who understands Africa. And I'd worked across Africa up to that point, understands technology um, and uh you know, can come and, and understands conservation. So I got the job. And so in 2003, just started looking at, could mobile phones be a useful tool for humanitarian conservation development work? It seems like a crazy question now because, you know, clearly they can be helpful. They can also be negative and they can also be destructive and they can also cause more problems than, than they're worth. But uh, at the time, there was a lot of hope and hype that they could be, could be useful and could be interesting. So I just started um, building mobile tech that had a conservation focus. I spent a fair bit of time around in South Africa and Mozambique looking at the impact of mobile phones on communities when they arrived, because those were the days when you could do a before and after, and you can't do that anymore. Oh, well, you can, but it's harder, right? It's harder to get that, that baseline data. But you can go into a community, you can see what's going on prior to the arrival of a mobile phone mast, and then you can see what changes a year or two later. So it was very magical, and I was very privileged to be around at that time. The thing that troubled me and the thing that led to, to Frontline SMS a couple of years after I, I started, almost every solution that was being developed by the humanitarian or tech communities, they were all focused at the much higher end. It was all about top-down uh, initiatives. So they were building tools for the World Health Organization, for Save the Children, for large international NGOs to use in order to send stuff down to people in the communities. And my work had always, I'd always seen communities doing pretty good work themselves. You know, communities self-mobilize. They're not sitting around always waiting for help. They've got their own ideas. They've got their own ambitions. They want to do their own projects. And nobody was building tools that worked for them. And so Frontline SMS came out of that frustration. It was like, hang on a minute. I see more value in the work being done on the ground by local groups with no money, no technology, very few resources, Nobody's looking at them and trying to help them. What can I do in order to build something that might leverage the, the growing ubiquity of mobile technology that works where there's low internet, low tech skills, not much equipment? And that, that's where Frontline SMS came from. It was a rebellious act in a sense to build something that nobody else really, either they didn't see it or they couldn't be bothered to try to, to serve that need. I'm not sure which one it was. So at that time... 
uh, aside from being sort of a top-down approach and focusing on the the sort of institutions in the humanitarian work, what was the intended solutions that were you know thought to be needed? Um, you know, today we think of it oftentimes as uh, let me just say we we often think of it as like. At least, you know, somebody who's not deeply entrenched. I hear frequently about sort of exchanging money and, you know, doing conducting business. Um, but in an article you wrote on the Responsibility Tech website, you know, you talk about even like, you know, it, you know, use of a flashlight, right? Having the light on there, sort of, you know. So there's all these sort of um, ways that we sort of bend these technologies to sort of fit other local contexts. Um, but I'm wondering, at the time when this was beginning, what was it? What was the presumption of the, you know, the development community in, in terms of what they thought was needed? Well, if you sort of picture back to the sort of late 90s, early 2000s and think about what the landscape was like in most of the places where humanitarian organizations work, there was very, very little infrastructure. So when I was working around Africa in the sort of 90s, if you wanted to make a phone call, you would get in a car, you'd drive for an hour to the post, nearest post office and you'd join a queue and you'd make a phone call. And you'd have to hope the person you were dialing was waiting on the other end by the phone. Um, it was a lot of time, a lot of effort. The phone was obviously, you know, it was broken many, many, many times. And for an, an organization that, say, was working with thousands of people in a community, there was no easy way of communicating with them other than getting in vehicles and driving around. And that was happening in Kruger National Park when I was working there in early 2003. The Parks Authority would set a meeting up with 20 villages and it'd all be set. Then something would change get back in a car, drive around for a day, telling them all the new time, the new place, whatever it might be. It was hugely inefficient and you couldn't get the scale that you needed in order to really make the kind of difference that was needed. Mm -hmm. So when mobile phone masks appeared and phones started appearing, the, the obvious question for many was, ah, could we maybe send a message around to all the communities via text message? And could we use that as a way of informing them that a meeting might have changed or to call a meeting? And that was some of the really early uses. It was really simple. It wasn't clever, highly tech, you know, innovative stuff. Um, and so it was sending health information to communities. It was uh, arranging meetings. It was helping farmers with crop disease if there was a disease running through an area or market prices for their crops. Um, it was allowing people to report illegal logging. It was mostly just a simple form of communication, but meant you could do it from where you were standing and didn't require vast distances to be driven in a vehicle. And that was really it. It wasn't clever or smart. It was pretty boring, actually, but it was transformative. And now, um, yes, from those sort of early feature phones, there is now a transformation happening to more smartphones and more elaborate use of the technology. And so could you just, for those of us who are not deeply entrenched, could you maybe share a little bit about like what that market looks like, say again, in, in Africa, where you've, you've done a lot of work, you know, how is, um, how is a more, you know, sort of a fully featured smartphone really transforming, say like the business landscape today? Yeah, well, the older phones that you, you, know, you refer to, the, old, the older feature phones, which are you know, mostly Nokia phones. I mean, in, in the day I started, it, it used to, Nokias were everywhere and they were the dominant mobile provider until the iPhone came along in 2007 and basically signaled the end of Nokia. Um, Microsoft helped them along the way collapse, but um, that's a different story altogether. But, you know, feature phones could make phone calls and they could send text messages. And at the beginning, that's all people wanted. There was no other real need for a phone other than things like the alarm. You know, I'd be in a taxi, I'd be driving somewhere, you'd talk to the, I'd always be talking to people about how they use their phone. And that article you referred to on the, on the responsibility website, you know, most of that came out of observations and having, you know, having conversations with people. But people use the alarm a lot. They use the calendar. They use the, the screen. Before there was a flashlight, they would hold the screen up against, you know, things to see. Like we used to do. I mean, I used to get back late at night sometimes in the dark and I would put my phone on and hold the screen up to things to see what I was doing. Um, and so, you know, phones were used for some very pretty basic functions, but you couldn't connect to the internet. You couldn't really have meaningful two-way group conversations. Um, you couldn't download apps. And that was where everything was going in the developed world. And the challenge that, that most conservation organizations and humanitarian organizations had was that despite there was despite this growth in technology use in the West, so to speak, the phones in the developing world remained the older older models and internet connectivity remained remained low. Smartphones were also very expensive when they started out. So, you know, you couldn't get a smartphone for less than a, sort of a couple of hundred pounds um, at the beginning. What's changed is that internet coverage has grown. It's still very poor. I mean, half the planet still can't get online. 
And I think sometimes we forget that. And smartphones require charging most days. Um, now, the old Nokia phones I used to use, you could run them for a week, sometimes 10 days, and they would not die. I mean, the battery just lasted forever. If you don't have power at home, that's a brilliant device for you because you don't have to worry about charging it every day. So smartphones need charging more often. They, they required internet access. The apps required internet access. You often required money to, to pay for that airtime and to pay for that data. And these were all things that were still problems and still, in fact, remain problems for, for many people. So although smartphones are now, you know, maybe a third to 40% of phones in, in many developing markets are smartphones, just because people have them, it doesn't mean they can fully use them. And feature phones are still incredibly common uh, and, and in many places still dominant because of the lack of internet, um, because of the lack of access to app stores, the lack of credit cards to pay for stuff, um, and so on. So there's still a, quite a divide there, um, even though smartphones have been around for 14 years. And sort of you know, features aside or just moving beyond the features, what what did you see in terms of um, how these phones were sort of perceived and like the meaning that they gave to somebody's life when they transform practices like communication and interaction or, uh, you know, I, I think I, you know, I think today even, you know, you can check, you know, I think it's frequently used to check like, you know, prices of sort of food markets. Right. And so it's, you know, how, how are, how are some of these, you know, how are the devices perceived differently and what kind of, um, you know, I'm trying to understand, like, even though the features are different, you know, say in in maybe the developed space um, versus what we're discussing, the way that even those features obviously are sort of understood, you know, sort of made use of or is very different. And so is there any interesting insights in that space about just how, say, people that you were working with sort of uh, really you know, how how did it give meaning to their lives in a way that it would differ here? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it was often called the mobile revolution when I began working in it. And and for, for many local people, it, it was a revolution. So, you know, in many developing markets, people leave their villages, they go and work in the, you know, the urban centers, they go out in, in search of work, and there's quite a distance between them and their family. All of a sudden, they could c- contact their friends and contact their families um, regularly through a mobile phone um, or, or a text message. So before then, there was no way of really doing that apart from you know running to post offices and doing it a hard way. And in many cases, people would leave home for a long time and never be able to really reach out. So so purely on a personal you know comfort level, it opened up a huge opportunity for people to be able to maybe travel further or more, more people to travel. Um, I think also the, the 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 one thing that was I think probably most interesting was um, you know the way mobile money appeared. Because you know phones didn't originally do mobile money, and I think there's a there's a, a misconception that mobile money was developed by you know in the West. So M-Pesa in Kenya, for example, um, it was developed by Vodafone and using government money in the UK. Um, so it was actually a, a Western paid for product. But the idea for M-Pesa came from people texting scratch card numbers to each other to pay off debts. Now, I started to see this and I actually blogged about this. And I I sometimes feel quite silly that I didn't jump in on the axe because clearly it became a big deal. Um, But if if I owed somebody 3,000 shillings and they were 100 miles away, um, obviously it's very hard to to pay that debt. So I would buy a 3,000 shilling scratch card. I would reveal the number and I would text them that number and they would put that number into their phone, get the 3,000 credit and voila, that, that debt has been paid. I think this, um, you know, and that along with using the, the screen to, to shine on things, these were all uses that people found of these phones that were never really conceived in the beginning. And people were ringing up and, and hanging up to say I, I was okay. So you'd arrange with, with a friend or a family, say, I'll ring every Sunday night and I'll hang up. And if you get the call, you know I'm okay. There's no cost involved. Um, and the mobile operators hated this, and they actually started allowing people to do this in a more structured way because they realized people were using their phones um, for this. Because a dropped call is a, a dropped call on the network. It looks as if the call has been, you know, it's the technology, technologically the call has just dropped for, for, for the tech reason. Um, so I was sort of watching people doing all of these things. And I think that, that was really fascinating, that even though these were very simple devices back then, People were finding all sorts of ways of kind of hacking the system in a way. Um, and most of these solutions they came up with became full-blown solutions offered by the companies themselves. 
Yeah, some of which, uh, you know, you speak in your article about like, you know, the, the battery charging, right? And some of which now obviously we see all over, right, in in, in sort of the global north. And um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, the process of this sort of local innovation happening and how some of that is, you know, I guess oftentimes we think like, you know, innovation comes out of like the key innovation centers, quote unquote, of, of the world, you know, US, Europe, broadly speaking, uh, increasingly China, right? We sometimes forget that, you know, the local context of use frequently uncovers, you know, really amazing uses of technology that have, uh, that may extend you know, far beyond those local contexts. And so, um, you know, in building frontline SMS, I, you know, if you're going to scale it to 190 countries, obviously there's some learning that has to happen in each of those. So how did you make use of that, you know, the, that understanding from a local level and then bring that back into your innovation process? Yeah. I mean, it became very, very clear to me early on that, as I mentioned earlier, the people in these within the communities I was visiting were not just passive recipients of technology. They had their own ideas. They wanted to do their own things and, and they were being stopped from doing that. And that frustrated me because having studied, you know, global development at university and you realize that it was people often that looked like me that were arriving with, with ideas that were you know, developed thousands of miles away, which had no local context, but which a funder somewhere had found sexy or interesting that had allowed that project to come to life. People were just flying around the world with, with solutions and most of them just didn't work. There was no local ownership. There, was no, there wasn't any real context or any use for it in many cases locally. And the fact that people locally had their own ideas and they weren't able to do anything with them really, you know, really frustrated me. So, you know, Frontline SMS was designed as a way to say, look, if you have an idea and it involves text messaging, you know, large numbers of your community or receiving messages from community members, here's a platform you can use. It, it All it does is allows you to send lots of messages receive lots of messages, sort them in fancy ways, trigger auto replies. So if somebody texts in the word potato, you can set it to automatically text back the price of potato. You know, And a lot of this functionality was, was reserved to the more complex systems at the time. But the fact it could run on a really cheap laptop with a mobile phone attached to it with a cable sitting in a hut somewhere with one bar of signal meant that it, you were taking the power of mobile technology right to the kind of last mile. And so when it's um, when it started being used, I had no idea what it was going to be used for. Um, I had no real use cases in mind. I mean, I, the the idea had come out of the conservation work in Kruger National Park, where I'd met these these rangers who were driving around for a day, rearranging these meetings. And we all thought there must be a better way, and we all thought phones might do it. But there was nothing at the time that they could use that would allow them to send all those messages and, and filter replies. So when you mentioned it, you know, it scaled to 190 countries, it only scaled that far because people just figured out themselves what to use it for. And I didn't have any, any involvement in any of that. Um, I simply made something available, gave it out freely, um, helped people if they need it, um, needed it, and, and stepped back, actually. Um, I had a day job at the time. This was a hobby. You know, this was like stamp collecting for the techie. Um, I went home at weekends. I'd add functionality. I'd fix bugs. I would keep the website going. But I, I didn't do anything um, for the first two years. Uh, and people just picked it up and used it. And I think for me, the lesson there is that all you need to do is provide people with the tools, right? If you want, you know, if, if you need holes digging in a community, you could fly around with a spade and dig the holes for them. Or you could give them spades. And I wanted to give them spades. Great. And so in 2012, you did, um, you know, you, you stepped away from that and today you're at Yoti. So your role is head of social purpose. And so what, you know, what does uh, Yoti mean by that title that you've been given? So uh, when I, when I, I joined Yoti in 2018, so there was a six year gap between leaving Frontline SMS and, and joining Yoti. And I, I wrote some books and did a lot of consulting work and did a lot of speaking and, and writing and so on over that time. I eventually got frustrated with the humanitarian global development world. It didn't seem to really want to do what was right for many communities. And I just got very angry. And I was going to bed angry and I didn't want to be going to bed angry. So I decided it was time to go. So um, I, I joined Yoti in, in 2018 and I knew Yoti because I was on their guardian council. Now, Yoti provides a digital identity solution. It allows you to prove who you are online or in person through a smartphone app. 
Um, I'd been on their Guardian Council for two years. They'd heard about the work that I was doing. They liked the approach I had. So I helped them figure figure their way through some of the ethical and other challenges that they faced as a business when they were developing their tech. Uh, in 2018, they heard I was looking for a job and they offered me a job. And they are a very purposeful business. So they're set up as a B Corp. So they, they are you know, socially focused from the begin, very beginning. It's all about doing well by doing, doing good. Um, we have ethics committees and green teams, and we signed up to all sorts of pledges. Um, our technology is designed in a way where we can't sell users' data because we can't actually see the users' data. And so they were already doing good things and doing it in a good way. And I think they were already set up almost perfectly for somebody like me. I didn't want to join a company with a bad track record. I was you know, keen to continually do good. And so my role as head of social purpose was to take what they'd already started and to think about additional things we could add on top to help the company make better social and environmental use of the tools they'd built and the expertise that they'd built up. So it was a clean slate. Um, it was actually a, a, a very fun, fun job to take on. Great. And so let's talk a little bit about ide digital identity. So I guess there's the question of, you know, what, what does that mean from a technology perspective? But then there's also the question of what does that really mean to, you know, a human who uses a digital product and how do they even understand that term? Um, so maybe let's start with the first part, you know, like when you're sort of selling digital identity, if you will, and you know, as an organization, we'll say like as, as, as it's being sort of positioned, what, what does it mean? So, um, you know, when the internet was designed um, many, many, obviously years ago by Tim Berners-Lee, um, identity was, wasn't really built in from the start. So there was never really any intention that you might need to verify that you were who you said you were at the point of doing something online. Um, people visited websites and they got information back and then Web 2.0 made it interactive Then payments came. But now, you know, if you're accessing a, a, a financial site or online shopping or doing something that involves money or something that might have some deep personal value, you want to be sure that nobody can pretend to be you um, because that's not good. Uh, you know, so identity theft is a major, major problem for people that find their identity stolen. It can destroy their credit rating and, you know, can be almost be an issue for, for many years. And it's expensive to fix. So for, for Yoti, the idea that you can, say, access a banking site or access a legal site or log into a social media account, say, and only you can get into that account because you have to digitally verify using your bi a biometric of your face that it is you doing that makes it secure, makes it comfortable, makes it makes it safer. And so as we increasingly do more and more online, as more and more government services go online, as more and more financial services go online, um, and it's becoming increasingly important for, for you to be able to securely verify you are who you say you are to stop other people from doing it, solutions like Yotis allow you to do that. So, you know, you have your digital identity on your phone. Um, I can explain in a minute, if you like, how you go about doing that. But once you have the identity on your phone, if you say log into a, um, say a, a dating site or a financial site, you would um, scan a QR code using your Yoti app on the website, and you then verify with the site using your your digital identity and your face that you are that person, and then you get in. Um, and we have a number of governments that use Yoti. So the, the the island of Jersey, where I was born, funnily enough, in the Channel Islands, they use Yoti to provide. Uh, Ireland has access to government services. So when you file your taxes, you log in using Yoti. Um, so the government know that you are doing that. And you can access other things as well that way. When you go to a nightclub, you can get in by showing a bounce of the screen of your phone, which shows that you are over 18 because you have that Yoti. If you're buying alcohol at a supermarket and you have to prove you're over 25, you can do that using your Yoti. Um, so it's a reusable, multi-use identity, but it means that only you can get in and do the things that you might want to do that are going to be attributed to your name. And so when you're conducting research, how do people perceive the concept of identity online? Do, do they sort of get it in the way you just described it, or is it wholly something different? I mean, I, I've been on, on webinars where the, the discussions around what identity is um, they go on for days, you know, and we'll almost have conferences about it, right? I mean, I think um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, 
the, the, the real proper answer is. I think there's lots of different ideas and thoughts around around identity. Um, if you think about how, for example, Facebook would 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 see you or recognise you, it's it's the pattern of your posts, it's the the way you behave, the way you interact that creates this kind of footprint or this digital footprint. And so, when you can log into a site using your Facebook ID, you may never have proven to Facebook at the beginning that you were who you said you were. But they begin to learn through the patterns of behavior that you most likely that individual and then they other sites trust that enough to allow you to log in. I think your identity is it's everything from your physical attributes. Clearly, I think most people view it as that. It's how you look. It's how tall you are. It's the color of your eyes. It's birthmarks. It's the kind of things you might have on a passport. But it is also it's the music you like. It's it's your personality. It's your character. It's it's the way you interact with other people. I think it's a whole complex array of things. And there are digital identity products now emerging which can supposedly identify you by the way you look, not not biometrically, but just by the way you behave, you know, by the way your head tilts or, you know, you talk to the, the, the camera. And some can now tell how happy you are or how sad you are or even what you're thinking, supposedly, by just looking at your at your face. So it's becoming quite behavioral. But I think identity is all of those things. And so, you know, one thing I've uh, found when when doing research is that there's a lot of confusion around uh, you know, a related topic is is there's a lot of confusion around privacy uh, and security, I should say, right? In, yeah. uh, in the sort of, you know, sort of, uh, I don't want to say general user, but, you know, people who are not coming from an IT background oftentimes have a lot of misunderstandings of, of uh, you know, for, say what's being collected, you know, the the risk of certain behaviors online, you know, why... You know, say two-factor authentication is is worth that quote-unquote headache, right? There's there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding in that space, and so you know the re- the need then to protect your digital identity online is sort of tangentially related, but it's you know it's not maybe at least from the people I talk to in, in similar spaces, I would say not well understood. So, do you find that people realize the need for a product like YoT? You know, in your research, you know, is it is it clear why somebody needs to use that, or is that still a little bit of an uphill battle? Well, I think we're in the early days um, still. I think the more privacy or data breaches there are that hit the headlines, the more people start to realise, and the more identity theft there is, and the more horror stories. And I think the pandemic has led to almost an epidemic of of fraudulent phishing activity. Um, because I, I get text messages every week now telling me there's a parcel waiting to be picked up at the post office, but I've got to pay two pounds. Um, you know, I know what to look out for. I get messages from my bank and and from other banks all the time telling me to log in and do things. Um, I think the pandemic has has brought this much further up in the public conscience because a lot of people have lost a lot of money because of it. But I think it's still educationally a big issue. I think the fact that people, for example, have Alexas in every room in their house and they don't turn the microphone off or they don't set the settings so it doesn't save their, their data, doesn't learn from their voice. Um, it doesn't use the data to improve Alexa. I mean, we have them in our house, but I've turned ev- everything is off. Literally, they're, they're right down to the to the wire. It doesn't save any of our recordings. We haven't subscribed to you know Amazon using our, our recordings to improve Alexa. Um, I've got different accounts set up for different things, so they can't even link the accounts up. So I think um, people are, are willing to give up privacy and security for the convenience of having a light turned on by by using their voice. The novelty of it is enough for them. And I think that's quite shocking. Um, or they're willing to give up their privacy to be able to ask for a joke, um, which which I think is, uh, you know, the convenience sometimes wins over. And I don't think people really necessarily recognize what they're giving up for that convenience. It really isn't worth it in most cases. Yeah, is there anything you know based on your experience in the space that you think we can be doing to, you know, help educate people about privacy, security, you know, and just help them realize um, why they really need to take it a little bit more seriously than they do? I mean, I, I, it's been tried, hasn't it? I mean, it's been tried for a long time. Um, anyone who's watched The Social Network should be freaked freaked out <laughs> in a big way. And a lot of people will be freaked out. I mean, I'm, I'm off Facebook and Instagram. I have been for quite a while. Um, but again, I think people can't see their lives without it. So I, 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 think, I think probably more people are aware of it, but they, they choose to push it to the back of their minds. I think the real worry for me is when children start to get onto these things and parents willingly let their children 
start to use these tools and services when they're you know kind of becoming aware of the, the problems that that might create um, in the future. Uh, but I think that I, I think you know more people realize more than they know, but they choose not to really pay much attention to it. Lots of companies, lots of sites, lots of organizations spend a lot of time. Lots of government sites, for example, as well. Friends at an organization called Tactical Tech, who I've known for a very, very long time. All they've done for the last 10 years is try to educate people of, of you know trails they leave online and information that's left about them. I don't know if a lot of people are really that bothered. I, mean, I shouldn't generalize, of course, but I think a lot of people just don't really worry. I always check app permissions, for example, when I download an app, and I usually 90% of the time don't download the app because I'm just freaked out by the things it wants to steal off my phone. Um, and I'm sick of getting these clubhouse and these lunch meeting invites because, you know, people are sharing my mobile number and my email address inadvertently by signing up for an app because when they signed up for it, it they've allowed it to suck all their contacts off their phone. So, you know, my data is spinning around without me wanting it to be span around. Um, so these are horrible issues and more needs to be done, but I don't know how we get people to, to really pay attention. That's difficult. Yeah, the, the clubhouse example is interesting because um, it's actually like the genetics work that I, I did, and you know, you oftentimes find that. I, I, I use the example, and in fact, I use it on a recent podcast where people are uploading their genetic data to websites where it's basically made public. Yeah, it's almost it's like open sourcing your your genome, and you're essentially implicating you know your entire family you know, without necessarily realizing it. Uh, and in that case, with some of like the most private information uh, possible, right? And and so oftentimes today, it is not just sort of about us on, on any of these systems. It's it's a much, you know, it's, it's, it's many people around us, including friends in the case of like, say, Clubhouse and phone numbers. And um, and that, that's becoming a pretty tricky problem even to trace back, you know, at this point in time. Um, yeah. It's... Uh, you know, I don't have a solution on this call, but the unraveling that and and having that conversation is something that's coming up more frequently, and it's uh, it's probably one that's not talked about enough yet. You know, everybody's thinking yeah. about their own individual privacy, but it's it's really in the collective that it becomes maybe even uh, more concerning because you know seeing those sort of webs of of sociality and interaction and, and what you can sort of make of all that is really, really powerful oh, if you so wish to. Great. You know, I think Apple's recent decision to allow, you know, the iOS, is iOS 13, 14 or iOS 100, I mean, I lose track now, it goes up so much, but, uh, you know, to allow people to opt out of being being tracked by apps. And of course, Facebook and others kicked up a storm. But I think, you know, as more and more companies like that put it, you know, more to the fore. And your point about genetics, there was that, that San Franciscan or Californian murderer, wasn't there, from yeah, exactly. 30 years ago, only got caught because the daughter or something or the granddaughter had uploaded her with one two three and me or whatever it was genome data it was crazy yeah yeah it's it's wild what's going on in that space and that's that's not the only example there, there's there's many coming oh, sure. out of there that are that are interesting um so i wanted to go back though so okay so in terms of the implementation of digital identity so there's yeah there's a need to protect you know to, to make the internet more secure but it also sort of raises the question of the digital divide. And so if governments are moving services to these, you know, it, uh, to, to use something like Yoti, you still have the problem, well, what about the people who lack, you know, internet communication technologies for any given reason, or, you know, uh, lack it in totality, lack it, you know, in terms of stability or, you know, ease of access, whatever it may be, or like, um, you know, you gave the example uh, in, I think, that Responsibility Tech article about how, say, in in um, some of your past work, you know, you see that mobile phones are often shared, right? So there's all these reasons why, like, you know, one person may not have a device all the time or, or may share it. And um, I appreciate that differs a little bit between sort of the developed world and, and, and such, but there is still, you know, the digital divide is real. And like, say, in the States right now, as there's all these debates going on about voter identity and the need to have that, you realize, of course, that that can live, leave people behind, whether it's physical or digital. And so how, you know, how do you deal with that kind of problem so that essentially the people that get left behind are all are those who are not already disempowered? 
Yeah. I think what's interesting with any tech solution is when it, when you choose the technology platform that you're going to develop on, you're making an unconscious, in many cases, decision to exclude people. Sometimes it's a conscious decision, but you know you're aware that if you're you're going to have these requirements to a, for a tech, then there are going to be people that can't meet those requirements. And you're right, digital divide is is it's alive and well in the UK too. There are communities in Scotland and you know the out, outer reaches of places that that don't have broadband. Um, you know, even in the UK. So it's everywhere. It's not just a developing world problem. I mean, I think for companies such as Yoti, you know, private sector company with its, its core products, its, its, its core markets are companies who serve products to people who who do have access to the technologies you'd need to have a digital identity. It wouldn't make sense for a bank, for example, to deploy a solution which required their customers to have something they didn't have. So, you know, if 90% of those banks' customers do have a smartphone, do have internet access, or even maybe 60 or 70%, it probably makes worth it worth, worth their while to do that. But for those that can't do that, you, you have to have a plan B for them. You can't simply do a blanket implementation of a tech and say, well, without this, you're stuck. Right. So you'd still need to accept paper documents if they exist. You still need to be able to accept, um, you know, earlier versions of, of proof of IDs in order for that. And then perhaps wait for them to catch up because there's always the hope that one day they will they will catch up. Of course, I mean, it's in the case of the digital divide, I don't know, haven't made a huge amount of progress. Um, because having internet access isn't everything. You still need the device. You still need the, and you know, and, and in some cases, you look at the coverage in in developing countries. You can look at a map and say, oh look, it's all covered there, but the quality of the signal is so awful, or the bandwidth available is so awful, it's actually unusable, even though it's registered as having coverage. Um, so I think for companies such as Yoti, obviously the core products, it's less of an issue because our core markets do have the devices that we want. But if we're thinking about refugees, we're thinking about using the kind of tech that we have in the places where there are infrastructure challenges. We do have to think very differently about what we build and what we produce. And we're very much you know, keen on doing that. And we've run a fellowship program to help us better or to help the sec- sector better understand issues of exclusivity in these markets. What happens when solutions are rolled out? by governments and people can't use them. If you need a a smartphone to access government services or food rations or whatever it might be, and you cannot provide that, what happens to you? So we're aware of it. We don't have any answers yet either, but we're aware of it and we're trying to help the sector better understand those problems so that we can better respond to it um, as quickly as possible. And um, the fellowship program you spoke of, is that, you know, are you looking to put social scientists in those roles or is it just anybody who can sort of, who understands the problem space? It's more the second. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to get local actors, people who were living, in many cases, living or experiencing or, or with people who were experiencing the challenges to do the research. So we needed people who could write. We needed people who understood how to do research. We needed people who could, you know, coherently put together something and present some kind of materials at the end. But we didn't want to be giving, you know, people who had multiple fellowships who had a track record of getting, because there were people out there, right, it's just their whole careers are just getting fellowships and getting money and just doing research. And many are very good at that, but we didn't want to just be, you know, continuing that. So our three fellows were individuals in, in most cases who hadn't had a fellowship before but who were living in countries where there were problems and they had an interesting take on that problem. And so we supported them financially for a year to go out and do that research and produce a paper. And we're about to publish those in the next two or three days on our website. Mm-hmm. We had a fellow in Argentina, a fellow in South Africa, and a fellow in India. And I'm, I'm proud that we supported people who in many cases would not have had a chance to do that work had it not been for our fellowship. That's great. And so, you know, those kind of opportunities that some people, um, I don't want to say fall into because obviously they, they applied and, you know, they, they put forward something good, but those sort of more serendipitous opportunities kind of relate to a little bit about your career journey. And that sort of relates a little bit to, to the book. And so you want to tell us a little bit about, um, the pursuit of purpose that you're working on your next book and, you know, and, and give us the sort of the elevator pitch of that. Yeah, so um, 
as I sort of alluded to, I guess, during this um, conversation, you know, my, my career has been incredibly random. Um, I've, I've run out and charged in all sorts of directions to try and do different things, to try to figure out how I can be useful in the world. And I always just wanted to be useful. And when I started out, it wasn't called purpose. It was more like, what's the meaning of life kind of stuff, right? I mean, purpose has become a bit of a, a key word now. And pursuit of purpose just sounds like a good name for a book. So I've just kind of, and I've had a social purpose, so it all fits in. Um, but, but, you know, I, I charged off to all sorts of countries, done all sorts of different work, usually hadn't succeeded in finding anything at the end, in many cases ending in failure uh, until I broke my leg. And that led to this early mobile work where it all, all took off. People have told me for many years, you should write a book about your journey how you started out, Live Aid in 85, and how seeing that, the suffering on TV kind of really got you, um, woke you up um, emotionally to the, to the problems of the world and the fact that you were you know, born in a lovely place where there weren't those problems. And I felt very guilty about that. And so I was just continuing to being told I should write a book. Uh, and I just didn't want to because I've never felt that it's never been about me. I'm more interested in the people that are experiencing the real problems and who need the help. But then lockdown happened and um, just had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to reflect. And so I just, and I love writing. And so I just started writing my journey and um, it sort of morphed into the pursuit of purpose. And so it's become a three, three part book, you know, the search for purpose, which is 150 pages of just going out in the world doing conservation work in Uganda, going to university, teaching English in Finland, running a primate sanctuary in Nigeria, just kind of charging around like, ah, what, what should I be doing? And then part two is when I broke my leg and I started working on mobile, that led to Frontline SMS. It led to 12 awards over a five-year period, you know, three million in funding, traveling all over the place, you know, being seen as a leader in the use of mobile phones. And then, you know, just going back then to thinking about purpose in part three, you know, what does purpose mean? What does it mean in different cultures? Uh, and so the book really is about that. It's, it's, it's my life really traveling through my life as finding purpose, living purpose, and then trying to better understand purpose and then helping other people who might be trying to find it, figure out ways that they might be able to do it. Uh, maybe in a slightly less haphazard way that I did it. Your uh, your comment there about you know what does purpose mean in different cultures? Obviously, there are too many answers to that to uh, right uh, to to elaborate <laughs> on now. But is there any uh, ex, you know is there any uh, that jump out at you that would be fun to share? Um, well, there's I'm, I'm trying to think um, of the uh, so ikigai right in Japanese or ikigai in Japan, which is kind of living your life in a way of sort of fulfillment and happiness. That That's sort of a purposeful. There's a lot of books now you can get on ikigai, which um, and that's become a little bit too um, commercialized in a, in a sense. There's huge, huge, I think, which is in from the Netherlands or from Sweden, which is another kind of way of living. Um, in Finland, they have sisu, which I came across when I lived in Finland, which is like an inner strength. And it's an ability to continue on in the face of adversity. And, and so it, in many cases, it's not really purpose. It's more about living your life in a way which fulfills you more. And that, in a sense, leads to happiness, meaning and, and purpose. So the end goal isn't always purpose. But I found about 20 or 30 you know, different cultural references and meanings of, of happiness, meaning purpose in life. And I try to touch on some of them in the, the latter parts of the book. And of course, you know, anthropology is a great subject to be interested in, in order to, to do that, right? Um, because when I was at university, I studied cross-cultural interpretations of violence, and I was just completely shocked how many different ways there were of defining violence. That in some places, a particular act was fine, and in other places, it was murder. Um, so <laughs> these terms often are quite complex across cultures. And I think it's what makes it interesting. And so you have been running a Kickstarter campaign, which did meet its goal, but now you are, you know, you're, you're raising more. And then with any of that excess, you're planning to donate uh, copies of the book. Yeah, that's right. So I didn't want to have any complicated stretch goals. Kickstarter has this habit of when people get the money, they start building the project to bigger and bigger, and then it just collapses. Um, for me, anything over the money spent on the book, producing the book, um, we'll, just, we'll just ship copies to libraries, to schools, to universities, to colleges. Because, you know, a lot of young people today are con increasingly asking, you know, how they can be useful in life. I think we know through millennials and just the, the way the world is turning, uh, often not in a good way 
for many young people. You know, the kind of jobs they'll be doing when they leave school um, you know, don't currently exist. Um, we have climate change. We have many people who want to work for companies and, and do good rather than just make money. So I think there's this growing awareness and this growing kind of desire to, to commit your life to, to having purpose and to doing good on the planet while we're here. And I think the, the book touches on that. And I think the journey I had starting with nothing, struggling, building a solution which ended up in almost every country in the world, and then learning from that. I think there's some powerful lessons in there, which I hope you know, will be useful to young people who are trying to find their way. And so it just makes sense to make it available to people if they want to read it. Great. Well, congratulations on meeting the the goal of Kickstarter, uh, mm. and I hope you know much more success in terms of raising on there because of of course getting that book out does sound like you know a much needed much needed addition. Um, so, for anybody who is interested, I will link to the Kickstarter uh, campaign in the show notes. But for, uh, if they want to learn more, or if they want to get in touch with you, what, what's a good place to to get some information? So um, my work at Yoti um, is www.yoti.com, Y-O-T-I. So there's a social purpose section there, which explains my work. My personal work is kiwanja.net, um, and I'm sure you can probably link, link to that too. So Kiwanja is basically um, 14 years, 15 years of my life in mobile. Everything I learned, everything I saw, everything I developed, everything I thought was wrong, things that I thought was right, people I've met, speeches I've given, things I've written. So it's, it's all in there. It's all openly accessible. And that's the best place. And then I'm Kiwanja also on Twitter, um, although I, I use Twitter less these days. I think LinkedIn has surprised me by being actually becoming the most useful platform I'm on. I used to hate it at the beginning. Never quite knew what it was for, but you know it's how we met, right? So it, it clearly has its advantages. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, seems to have helped with Kickstarter for sure. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of good networking. There's a lot of good response to the book on there. So yeah, it's LinkedIn has it's taken on a different tone during COVID, but it also has mm. proven to be pretty effective for a lot of business reasons. Correct. Sure. So, well, Ken, thanks very much. Appreciate your time. Um, I will link to those and uh, hope to uh, maybe meet up somewhere in the future. Yes, hope so. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Anthropology and Business Podcast. To learn everything you need to break into business anthropology and why business anthropology is one of the best lenses for contributing to business success, visit my website at mattarts.me, where I cover many topics related to business anthropology and beyond. There you will find all the podcast episodes, blogs, and news. Please like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.